So if I brought you here uh, with the idea that we would talk about up until now Netanyahu's new normal, that's the facts on the ground. But if we want to understand where we're going, what direction we're heading in, we need to talk about Netanyahu's next normal, which is Bennett's new normal. And so for the next section of the presentation, I'm going to speak a little bit about the legislation that's on the government docket that the Jewish Home Party is introducing into the Knesset to be debated. The bills that we're looking at, the future of Israel, what's coming around the corner, up around the bend. Okay. So... The next normal, as I said, we're talking about the Jewish Home Party and their legislative agenda. So this is Moti Yogev, a legislator of the Jewish Home Party, and he says that we need to bulldoze the Supreme Court. Okay, what's this about? Why does the right wing in Israel despise the Supreme Court so much? They would say that the Supreme Court is like the last bastion of liberalism in Israel. I would disagree. That's not how I would define it. I would say rather that it's a whitewasher of the government's worst excesses. That what so often happens time and time again is that the government will propose a new law that's racist as hell. Now, the Supreme Court is put off by this. It's just so blatantly racist. They can't possibly allow this law to pass without comment. <coughs> Pardon me. So they say, all right, well, this clause, let's, let's, let's eliminate this clause. It's a little bit too racist. And this, this aspect of the law, let's curtail this a bit. And so then they, you know, they, they make some modifications and then they send it back to the legislature saying, you know, as is, it's unconstitutional. And then the government, all it does is doesn't get the message that maybe it's gone too far and it needs to pull back from the brink. No, instead, it just re-legislates the exact same law using a loophole to get around the Supreme Court you know, unconstitutional, un, you know, the Supreme Court says it's unconstitutional, they'll just get around it with a little loophole and then pass the exact same law. So whatever they wanted to do, the racist, uh, the, the racism they wanted to implement still happens. It just takes a few months longer than they originally anticipated. But this bothers them. The fact that they even have to wait any time until it becomes a law, until their, you know, the, their ideas are, are implemented. So now they want to neuter the Supreme Court altogether so they won't even have to wait and go through that, those hoops. Now, this isn't some kind of uh, private member's bill that is just one person, like a one-off. No, this bill is receiving support even from the Jewish Home Party chair, Shuli Mualem, and also many other religious legislators have signed on as uh, uh, all to, all, signing on to the law as, as proponents. And it's not only the religious parties who are doing so. Also, we see at that same conference where the law was announced, we see this legislator, Nurit Koren, from the ruling Likud party, from Netanyahu's party. So this has support on, you know, from various parties that, that are factions of the government. And not only Nurit Koren, but others as well, all from the Likud party. Now, True, these were the legislators that signed the bill, that are proposing it in the parliament, but they didn't author it. They're just putting their signatures on the bill. The ones who actually authored the law, if you can imagine this, we see uh, them standing behind the podium, and you see this logo on the podium. They're the group that actually penned it. And this is the Derech Chaim movement. And they're headed by this man, Rabbi Yitzchak Ginsburg an American rabbi of the Chabad movement. Now, who are Dere Chaim and what do they want? I actually spoke about them when I was here a couple years ago. They are a dominionist movement. And uh, just to parse that, because maybe y'all aren't necessarily familiar with that term. So a bit about Israel. You know, we, we've already said Israel wants to call itself a democracy, claims that it is one. Again, I would argue that it isn't a democracy, but rather an ethnocracy that uh, in Israel, our rights are not granted on the basis of citizenship, but rather on the basis of ethnicity. If you are the correct ethnicity, if you're Jewish, then you get the full set of rights and privileges. But if you are of another ethnicity, if you're not Jewish or less Jewish somehow, by their definition, then you receive a smaller subset of rights, fewer rights, maybe no rights, depending on who you are. So 
Having said that, if Israel isn't a democracy, if it's an ethnocracy, for these people, that's not enough. They don't want privileges to be, you know, that's one thing for Jewish peoples to have privilege, but they want the next step. They want to take it to a theocracy where the laws of the land are the Torah and the Talmud, that it's a complete, there's no separation between synagogue and state. That's what they want to see. So this dominionist group are the ones that are actually authoring the law. Now, if you can imagine this, a couple years ago, three, four years ago, when they were having conferences, I would, to get into their conferences, to just know what's going on, what they're thinking, what they're saying, what they're planning, I would have to sneak in. I would have to like climb fences and go in the back alleys just to get into their conferences so that I could hear what they were talking about. Uh, but nowadays, there's no need to be in the shadows anymore. They're out in the open. They're partnering with the government itself. That gives you a sense of how far gone, how things have altered drastically in just a few years' time. Now, we talked about Der Chaim, a little bit about Yitzchak Ginsburg, the man who heads the group. Uh, this is the religious authority behind the book, The King's Torah, Torah Tamelech. I'm sorry to talk about this again, but it's important that we know who this man is and what he's done. This book came out a few years ago, and it's essentially a religious tract. Uh, it asks the question, the theological question, under what circumstances may a Jew kill a non-Jew? That's the thrust of the book, and the authors of the book come to the conclusion that pretty much under any circumstance, they say, quote, that there is justification for killing babies if it is clear they will grow up to harm us, if you can imagine this. So, this is the man behind legislation in the Israeli Knesset at this point, if you can imagine this. Now, these words are bad enough, but they're not just words. It's not that they have no effect. These words have meaning. They influence people, and people take those words to heart. Students of Yitzhak Ginsburg went out and put them into practice. They went to the West Bank village of Duma and they firebombed the home of this family and they killed this one. They actually killed a baby, a one-year-old baby boy, Ali Dawabshe, sleeping in his crib at night. His house went up in flames, burnt to a crisp. Ali Dawabshe, his four-year-old older brother, Ahmed, also was burnt from head to toe. There was no certainty. It was for... Quite a while, we didn't know if he was going to survive or not. He had burns over 90% of his body. He lay in the hospital suffering for a long time. Eventually, doctors thankfully were able to bring him, to nurse him back to health. And, you know, with, today, thankfully, he is back in class. I mean, he's, he's scarred over a large part of his body, but at least, you know, he's back in school. So we can say that. But despite the fact that his one-year-old brother, baby brother, was burned to death, his father, his mother were all burned to death. He's, the Israeli government has refused to offer compensation. They have refused to pay for his medical expenses, for everything he suffered, if you can imagine that. Now, what does Betzalel Smotrich of the Jewish Home Party, the star legislator of the Jewish Home Party, the deputy speaker of the Knesset, what does he say in response to the murder of these individuals, he says that the murder in Duma, in the village of Duma, with all its severity, is not a terror attack. Period. Terrorism, he says, is only violence carried out by an enemy within the framework of war against us. So in other words, if an Arab person kills a Jewish person, that's terrorism. If a Jewish person kills an Arab, that's not terrorism, according to Bitzal al-Smotrich. He says, those who call it terror are perverting the truth and cheapening the concept of terror. And he goes on to say, if Israel had deterred the enemy, we wouldn't have private individuals taking the law into their own hands. This is, this is how sick it gets. So he actually doesn't have a problem with this level of ultraviolence. He doesn't mind burning babies. He just doesn't want it to be privatized. He wants it to be nationalized. He doesn't want vigilante violence. He just wants those babies to be burned by the Israeli army itself, which, as we know, also happens on occasion, like these boys who were playing soccer on a beach in Gaza when Israeli jets rained missiles down on them, killing them. 
And I guess Betzalel Smotrich wants to see more of that. So just a little bit of a insight into his way of thinking. Uh, a few months ago, you may recall, there were protests in Jerusalem when Israel established um, metal detectors at Al-Aqsa, the Muslim shrine in Jerusalem. And people resented this. It's like the one last little bit of territory the Palestinians have some level of autonomy over. So people decided to protest this by refusing to enter through the security gates, and they just had massive pray-ins in the streets of Jerusalem, where they prayed en masse in the middle of the street. So what does Betzalel Smotrich do? He takes a photograph of people praying, refusing to enter the metal detectors, and he takes the photo and he slaps some text on top of it. Yavducha amim, that they shall come bending unto thee, they shall bow down at the soles of thy feet. So this is how he sees Palestinian people as his slaves. So we're talking about legislation that's coming up around the bend, right? So Smotrich, he holds a conference for his party faction, and at it he announces his decision plan. What's his decision plan? What to do about the Palestinian people? He says, we need to come up with a plan, some kind of solution. And his decision plan goes, I actually, I don't call it that, I call it the ABC plan, the Apartheid Bribe Cleanse Plan. Now, what, what does that mean? This, this is the crux of his proposal. He says, we're going to go to the Palestinian people, and we're going to say, First off, bribe. We'll, if you agree to leave the country and never come back, we'll give you a chunk of change. Here's money. Leave Palestine. You, you take that offer, great. Problem solved. You don't? You want to stay in the land? Okay. We move to the next option. After bribe comes apartheid. You don't want to take the bribe? You want to stay in the land? Okay, fine. But understand that you're going to be living under apartheid. No more, none of this uh, temporary occupation. I mean, we've been going over 50 years of Israel's occupation of the West Bank. No one in their right mind thinks it's temporary anymore. But let's say now Betzalel Smotrich is going to openly admit it and say it outright. This is permanent. You will have a lower status by law. Okay? If you want to stay in the country, these are the conditions you have to accept. You don't want a bribe. You don't agree to leave the country, you don't agree to have a lower status, stay in the country with a lower status, then the next option is cleansing, that we'll ethnically cleanse you by force. We will force you out of the country, physically. So this is the ABC plan. And again, just so you don't think it's some kind of one-off, that he did this out of his own accord and didn't have any support. No, at that conference where he announced the plan publicly, Netanyahu himself sent a video message greeting everyone there, effectively endorsing it. So this is the kind of discourse we see coming from the government, now openly flirting with ethnic cleansing. That, that last uh, series of protests when people were protesting outside Al-Aqsa, one of Netanyahu's ministers, Sakhya Negbi, actually had the audacity to say, if you can imagine this, posting it on Facebook, remember 48, remember 67. When you want to stop It'll be too late. It'll already be after the third Nakba. This is where we're at today. This is Israel in 2017. 